because that <laughs> makes me look important. <laughs> what I do. Um, so first of all, I see a lot of new faces, but I think a lot of you are visitors for our speaker, am I right? Are there any new members or visitors to the group? Um, I would like to hear from you guys, though, if you could stand up for me, if you don't mind. I hate to put people on the spot. Just kidding, I love doing this in my favorite part. <laughs> uh, so just say your name and how you heard about us, and welcome, by the way. Um, okay, Patrick Shea. My wife is Ellen. Hi. Um, I, yeah, it's internet, I guess. Um, I used to live in the Bay Area, and uh, I grew up, I'm a Southern California native, but I grew up in the Bay Area, and I just became like, a little fast. Always been interested in fossils, but um, I guess professionally, I guess there's a little bit of an intersection. I'm a, I'm a scientist with the California Department of Toxic Substances Control, so we do um, clean up of like hazardous waste stuff. CEQA, like um, you know, California Environmental Quality Act, Daily Ecological Resources is one criteria. Right. And so um, sometimes, you know, one of the mitigation measures is sometimes they have to have. Like our speaker on staff, <laughs> <with the monitor. laughs> Awesome. Well, welcome. Thanks for being All right. And so today, obviously, we're privileged to have with us uh, speaker Mr. Eric Scott. Uh, he's going to be speaking on treasures beneath our feet, finding fossils, and dodging bulldozers in urban America. That sounds so awesome. <laughs> Central Paleontologist for Cogstone Resource Management Incorporated, um, a consulting firm in Southern California. He's also an adjunct instructor at Cal State University San Bernardino. Main focus is on Ice Age mammals. Yes, am I right so far? Yes. Horses, bison, tapirs, and not tapirs, but yeah. Let's get stuff right. Um, that's just the name of you, the local inhabitant. Um, he's currently uh, Cogstone funding or finding Ice Age fossils in subway excavations near the Lavrey Chart. That's where we are now. Uh, as well as the throughout the state, but one of the areas of interest is determining how many species of horses we had here during the ice age and how they went extinct, and why, uh, how you can inform our understanding of the biology of living wild horses. So, without further ado, I will be quiet, and uh, thank you, sir. And I will not be quiet. Good. Well, that's how you did that, right? <laughs> Sorry. Can you all say that? Anyway, good afternoon. Thank you. I'm going to try and keep this to an hour or less. Uh, if you need to get up, feel free. If you have a question, feel free to ask it, and I will try to answer it. Because usually, I don't know about you guys, but if you hold the question until the end, you get to the end and then you go, ah, I forgot. Um, so ask it when it comes up, but keep in mind that I might fall behind on that hour promise I just made, number one. And number two, if I lose my train of thought, I will have to start over from the beginning. <laughs> Anyway, this is what the intersection of Wilshire and La Brea is interpreted to have looked at, looked like looking north probably about 20, 30,000 years ago. This is some recent artwork done by a young paleo artist named Brian Eng, who I strongly suspect you will be seeing a lot more from in the future because he's amazingly talented and has boundless energy. This was Cogstone's Christmas card this past year, so uh, we're, he'll be doing more for us, but he's also doing a number of other things. We'll look at some more of his art as we go, but this is what Southern California kind of looked like. This is what that intersection looks like today, except that it isn't. I found this picture online, and you know what you're not seeing in this picture? Cars. Cars! Oh. Which never happens at that intersection, <laughs> but I see all these bikes, so I'm wondering if there was some kind of biking event that was going on on this particular day. So this is not a real representation, but uh, it's a close facsimile of what the La Brea and Wilshire intersection would look like today, except that it's also not the whole picture, because if you go below the surface, this is what's happening, not today, because it's Sunday, but this is what is happening Monday through Friday and sometimes Saturday underneath the intersection at Wilshire and Brea, where uh, the Los Angeles Metropolitan Authority is building what's known as the Purple yeah. Line Extension. Yeah. This is the subway that goes out of Union Station in a variety of directions. And this is the Purple Line Extension that you see right here that will eventually, when these three segments are built, go all the way into Westwood and West Los Angeles. So you'll be able, I'm, I can't wait, honestly, because I live out near Riverside and San Bernardino. So the thought of just driving to the nearest train station, getting on a train and napping the whole way in, getting off right at the old, you know, Union Station, catching the Metro to the Little Brea Tarpets, 
and working here and thinking deep thoughts. I can't wait. But it is a multi-segment project, and today we're going to be talking about some of the fossils that were found on section one of this alignment. But basically, you're going to have these trains that are coming out of Union Station and stopping at various stations in this area. Uh, we have paleontologists looking for fossils where they are building the stations. These subway tunnels are being constructed by machines that dig in one direction and build the tunnel behind them, so we don't monitor those excavations. But where we're looking at stations, that's where we are digging. And so if you look at segment one of the purple line extensions, you can see that there are a variety of stations that are projected where excavation is going on right now. And of these, one of them was of some concern because it's by this place you may have heard of called the La Brea Tar Pits. And generally speaking, if you're digging somewhere around the tar pits, you're likely to encounter fossils. And some of what we're going to talk about today, a lot of you may already know. Please bear with me. You just never know your audience, so I may cover stuff that's very basic to you. But this is what Los Angeles used to look like back around the turn of the last century, where you didn't have the cities building up. But you did have these big oil lakes. You had a lot of oil being produced in the background. And here at La Brea, you had a number of fossils being excavated. This is where we get the record for the ice ages that we know so well from Southern California. At this point in time, everything you see in this picture, by the way, I should mention, is a saber-toothed cat, except for the guy in the middle. And so hopefully that gives you some idea, even in the early days, 1913 to 1915, when they were collecting here, uh, the volume of fossils was just astounding. There were almost three quarters of a million fossils recovered just in those three years. So that is a staggering collection. And that is also what formed the core of the Los Angeles Museum of History, Science, and Art, and actually was the centerpiece of their science hall when that museum first opened in the teens of the last century. And that's where a lot of what uh, some of you have heard. Now, some of you young people probably have up-to-date information on this stuff. But when I grew up, every book you could find on fossils, it was always dinosaurs. It was The dinosaurs are always kind of gray and scaly. And then the last two pages of the book would have a picture like this in there, where everything was kind of brown. And there was a saber-toothed cat roaring. Uh, and just all of the books had this. And this is how Southern California was interpreted to look kind of African savanna-like with saber-toothed cats and some other animals. And this is basically what you started. And this is the view of Southern California during the Ice Ages that has been promoted all over the world based on the fossils being found here at Little Brea Tarkins. So we knew, Metro knew, that there were going to be fossils in the subsurface in this area because of the proximity. But what we didn't know, what wasn't known, was whether or not there were, were more tar pits, more actual asphaltic deposits that were going to be encountered. So this is uh, the Fairfax Station. This is an exploratory shaft that was sunk down to look at the subterranean uh, sediments and so forth back in 2013. And so you've got a variety of different levels going all the way down there. And you can see this is actual excavation digging this exploratory shaft. And that person right there is not one of the construction workers. She is a paleontologist. And she is looking for fossils and finding them. Not asphaltic fossils like the ones you guys are used to working with, most of you who work here, but marine fossils from a formation underneath the Ice Age dirt here that's called the San Pedro Formation. It's a nearshore marine unit. And just in that exploratory shaft, uh, the uh, Cockstone paleontologist found over 4,000 different fossil specimens. Almost all of them were marine invertebrates. So I will be honest and fess up that I don't have a lot of interest in marine invertebrates. I am a vertebrate paleontologist. I see people gasping in the back. How can you not be fascinated by marine animals? Because they aren't horses. <laughs> Except for the sea horses. But never mind. Um, in any event, Nevertheless, it, while it wasn't necessarily my cup of tea, nevertheless it did confirm that there were fossils and that those fossils needed to be looked after. This is important, this kind of work is important, because usually when you talk about paleontology, when you see paleontology being done on television, this is the sort of thing you see with wide open spaces and beautiful vistas and millions of years of rocks and early paleontologists scrambling around the rocks in their real gear and looking muy macho and, and finding cool fossils. Whereas if you look at Los Angeles, this is not where you think of finding fossils. 
And it's not just because it's all covered with, with buildings and, and, and roads and so on. Now, if you go back and look at historic imagery, you can see that pretty much it's fairly low lying with low rolling hills, not a lot of topography, not a lot of desert uh, exposures. So it's not where you would necessarily go looking for fossils. That's why, one of the reasons why La Brea is so important, because it gives you a picture to an ancient past that otherwise you aren't going to find in this area. Not because it, it's not the right sort of area for finding this stuff. However, construction does go on. And you do have old buildings being replaced by new buildings. You have uh, new structures being built, excavation going on all the time. And as a consequence, there are sediments being exposed now that haven't been exposed in the past. And so you get to look for fossils there. And the reason you do that is uh, because of something that's called paleontological mitigation. And particularly in California, but also on federal lands and in some other states, paleontological mitigation is the process by which when fossils are impacted by construction or development, what you do is you mitigate those impacts. And you do that by avoiding the resources or by excavating them and getting out of the way. In California, as the gentleman was mentioning earlier, that sort of mitigation is required by something known as the California Environmental Quality Act of 1970. Uh, there's also various municipalities like Los Angeles County, Los Angeles City, San Bernardino County, Riverside County, San Diego County. Each of those areas also has uh, guidelines that preserve these resources, but it starts in many cases based on the California Environmental Quality Act. And so we aren't just doing this because it's fun. We're doing it, it can be fun, but we're doing it because it's required by law. And so. Uh, and I'm going to get into the weeds a little bit here, but I want you guys to kind of see what we're dealing with, because if you actually read the law, what CEPA actually says, what it requires is, would your project directly or indirectly destroy a unique paleontological resource or site or a unique geological feature? Which sounds great, and was clearly written by a non-paleontologist, because how would you define unique? What would you call unique? I know what I would call unique, but Number one, my interpretation is not a legal definition. Number two, there is no legal definition in CEQA. And number three, CEQA doesn't tell you, okay, if you can't impact a unique resource, what can you do? And it doesn't list guidelines for how you can approach it. It simply says that you may not impact a unique fossil or a unique site. So this is a mastodon in the Natural History Museum's mammal hall. This mastodon, Coxstone had nothing to do with it, I'm aware, but it still makes me very happy a beautiful specimen is relatively new. This is produced from a mitigation project in Timmy mm -hmm. Mount. Is wow. it unique? Mm -hmm. Technically, yes. It was a one-of-a-kind individual. Every single one of you in here is unique, but are you unique as the species Homo sapiens? Are you unique, are you unique as Californians? Are you unique as... It, it depends on what you're calling unique. So is it an individual unique? Yeah. Is that really a good reason to collect it? I don't know. Do we find mastodons anywhere else? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 yeah, right here. You're standing on them, probably. So, yes, you find mastodons elsewhere. So in that case, it's not necessarily unique. The other challenge with the whole unique argument is that it misses the point that paleontologists aren't interested in unique all the time. Yes, we are, but we're also interested in volume. That's another reason why the targets are so important, because you don't have a unique horse or a unique bison. You've got hundreds of bison and hundreds of horses and thousands of direwolves and thousands of saber-toothed cats. And it's that volume that enables you to study these animals in more detail so that you can actually look at populations of saber-toothed cats through geologic time. None of them are necessarily unique, but all of them are significant as part of a broader picture. So, the whole, while CEQA protects resources, it doesn't do it with a scientific understanding necessarily of what those resources are like. How about this? Are you all impressed with this fossil? Yeah. Yeah. Really? You guys are easy. <laughs> this is one of the cruddiest fossils I've ever seen. But it identifies something. Yeah, he's absolutely right. This identifies something. This was labeled, and literally, this was found back in 1993. It came in from the field. It was labeled large mammal long bone. And it sat on my desk for weeks. And I'll tell you, because I kept looking at it, and hopefully you can see. Can you see how thin the bone is right there? 
What animals have really thin bones? Birds. 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 Thank you. There's your scale bar. So this is a walking piece. So it looks like a bird, but it's too big for a bird. But it looks like a bird, but it's too big for a bird. But it looks like, and that's my brain going back and forth. Back. So this thing sat on my desk for weeks. And finally, I figured, I'll go talk to a bird person. And there was a bird expert here at the time. His name is Ken Campbell. He was the curator of ornithology here, a world-respected bird paleontologist, or paleontologist who studies birds there. That's more correct. And he recognized that it is a bird, and actually it turns out to be a new genus of bird, the largest, at the time it was the largest flying bird known from North America, and it got its own new genus name, Aeolornis, which means bird god of the wind, which is an excellent name, uh, it was named in 1999. So that cruddy fossil that might otherwise have been missed turns out to be enormously significant for bird paleontology. Who would have thought from that? You know, you think, wow, if it's a beautiful, spe a beautiful skull, it's a beautiful this, it's a beautiful that. It's a crappy fossil, but it's scientifically significant. So this again highlights number one what we're looking for, and number two how what CEQA actually says may not be as helpful as, as it could be. However, elsewhere in CEQA, you can find things defined as a historical resource if it's an object or site that it can be interpreted to be significant if it has scientific or educational value or it can be historically significant if it has yielded or may be likely to yield important evidence in prehistory or history. Hmm. So using this definition, suddenly just about every fossil you find has the potential to be historically significant because it may be likely to yield information important in prehistory. So over and above the actual unique paleontological site or unique paleontological resource language, we also use this to document that yes, it's actually a broader scope that protects fossils in CEQA. So to give you an example, we cannot collect every fossil we don't even try. But what we do attempt to do when we're in the field is look for something that looks like it might have some anatomy. And for you anatomists in the room, does anybody know what this is? This is what, how it looks literally the day it was found. Somebody found it in the subsurface, brought it up, and Captain. took this picture and sent it to me. Anybody? Captain? Go for it. It's like a, uh, like a part of a light bone, or like a femur, or like part of that? Not quite. No. no. Is it a No. It has, it has the joint. Uh, right here or right here? This Probably is right that now. one. I'll just cut to the chase. That's what it looks like when you clean it up. Okay. Now, anybody, Tell especially you, La Brea excavators, anybody? Uh, it's a vertebra. It's the vertebra called the atlas vertebra, and it's the one that's right behind the head. This is a bison atlas, and it's named the atlas after the Greek god Atlas, who holds up the world. Yeah. This is the vertebra that holds up your head. And so, this is. Is it more significant now that you can actually tell what it is? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Do you guys have bison here at the tar pit? Yeah. 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 So yeah. is it unique? No. Mm, maybe not. But if you then take this fossil and measure it and plot it against measurements of other fossils from other sites, here you have a graph in the, of three different measurements, and there is a cluster of measurements from up in Idaho and from a site in Hammond that are the longhorn bison, bison lanifrons. And then here are atlases of bison antiquas from here at the La Brea Tarkins. And you can see that there's a little bit of overlap there. But you can also see that this specimen from the subway is actually falling outside that range. So based on size, you can say that this is bison antiquas. And based on that, you can then place an approximate age on the fossils. Because bison latifrons shows up between about 130 and 190,000 years ago and then disappears by about 20,000 years ago, whereas bison antiqua shows up a lot more recently and then it disappears, I want to say, in California around 11,000 years ago, elsewhere in the country around 8,000 years ago. And so just by being able to identify this bone, now we can say that those sediments that produce this bone are constrained within the time frame of bison antiqua. And so not only are we saying bison was here, which we knew already from places like La Brea, we can also say that this sedimentary package that they're digging through has a specific age. 
or at least a relative. Yes, sir. So, um, the thing, we have the, um, the the crates outside, um, the twenty some odd crates, and, and you said you obviously you don't collect every fossil. Well, what was what allowed them to determine to take those samples and fill those crates? I love you. Um, because that's later in this talk. We're going to be talking about Project 23 a little bit. Um, but it, because basically it's the same thing, but it was a, cause this is an isolated fossil. They found a fossil, they dug it out, they carried it. When you find eight complete tar pits, the story changes. When you find 16 complete tar pits, the story changes a lot. So, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, so. Based on what we presented with CEQA, what we do have is if your fossil provides data on evolution or relationships or development, if it helps you determine the age of a rock unit, if it gives you information about the growth of ancient communities, if it's unusual or spectacular, or if it's about to be destroyed, in any of these cases you consider the you can consider the fossil to be significant, and in that case it's protected by CEQA. And presumably will end up in a museum, but you have to get the fossil out of the ground first. And so making these determinations isn't something that can happen in the field. The best they can do in the field is look at it like you just did, and some of you said it looks like a scapula, it looks like a limb bone, and so on. It has a joint. That's all you need. It has a curve, it has an edge, it has a roundness, it has a straightness that leads me to believe that somebody will be able to identify this. If they can identify it, it's probably going to be so that's what our field people are trained to look for, is fossils that are complete enough to be reliably identified. Mitigation paleontology is different from classic paleontology. Classic paleontology, you go to places like this, and you do this. You walk around a lot. It's very fun. It's very relaxing, especially when you know at the end of the day there's a beer waiting for you. And then you find <laughs> fossils like this. That is actually, this is Death Valley National Park. You aren't supposed to see this because we haven't talked about these fossils yet. But that is a mammoth tusk eroding out in northern Death Valley National Park. How cool is that? You were the first group this picture ever. <laughs> and then you dig things out like that, and then you excavate them, and you take them back to the museum. And that's how classic paleontology works. It's pretty much you go out, you look for it, you find it, you clear it off, you dig it out, and you back it goes to the museum. And mitigation paleontology is the same, except that this is the working environment. And it's extremely dangerous. And so you have to take a different approach. You aren't just wandering around in the desert. You are actively being threatened, to use the wrong word, but I'll go with it, um, by giant construction equipment. When you see the size of this and then the size of his windows, you realize he may not see you. So when you think about what you usually think of paleontologists wearing when they're in the field, and whether it's true in the Gobi Desert or even today, Nevertheless, this is not the kind of gear that you want to wear when you're working on a construction site. So paleontologists in the current uh, realm look a lot more like this. And in the subway, it's even worse. Not only do you wear the brightly colored vests and the hard hat and the safety glasses and the gloves and the safety boots and so on, you actually have to carry emergency respirators with you for the potential for gas leaks and so on. And you have to be trained and have your training re renewed every few months so that if there is an emergency and you are told to evacuate, you can put your rebreather on within two minutes or less and you know where the exits are and you need to get out. So all of that training is essential for working in a subway because you're below the surface. So here's a happy crew of paleontologists. You wouldn't think so. You'd think that maybe they were all construction workers, but no. Everybody you see here is actually a, a paleontologist with some really cool vehicles there. <laughs> and you go out on construction sites and you look for fossils. They do the digging. You only do some of the digging if they hit something that you think looks like a fossil and then you wave them off and you get in and you find it. If it's something big, then you can use construction tape or police tape to stake it off so that they know to stay away from this area. And again, all of this is built in so that you don't have to fight with people. You, they, they know that you're going to be there, they know what your job is, and if you stake off an area, they know to avoid it. Once you stake it off, you can start excavating, and sometimes it's as easy as picking up something like this, sometimes it's a little more involved. This is a mammoth skull from Irvine, California. Yeah. If any of you are familiar with the Cooper Center down in Orange County, this is currently in their collections. Uh, but this is a beautiful mammoth skull with the lower jaw from Irvine, California. 
Cogstone is currently busy cleaning up the rest of the skeleton to ship to the, the Cooper Center. But nevertheless, that's when I talk about treasures under your feet, that's one of them. And it's not from the Lebrand tar pits. This stuff is all over the place. It's under your houses. You kids, go dig up your yard. <laughs> Tell your parents, I said it was okay. Do as deep as you want, as many holes as you want, just have fun. I approve it. <laughs> Once you get these things exposed, though, it's classic paleontology. Again, you're working on a construction site, so you need to have all the gear on, but you clean the fossil up, you put fossil wrapping paper on it. How many of you have fossil wrapping paper? Good for you. What's wrong with the rest of you? <laughs> It's toilet paper. <laughs> See? Yeah. And you put that on the fossil and that acts as a separator for the plaster that you're about to apply. The plaster forms a nice cap. And then you excavate the fossil. And when it's something this big, if I was a dinosaur paleontologist working in Utah or Montana, I would now be wondering, how am I getting this thing out of here? Probably I'm going to have to write a grant and get a helicopter to fly it out. But when you're on a construction site, it's all pretty much part of the business where the equipment comes in and they help you lift this stuff into your vehicle and take it out. So it's actually one of the benefits of working on construction sites is having all that heavy equipment right there and usually very willing to help out. The construction people that we work with in almost every case are as excited about the fossils we're finding as we are. Um, so it usually is really a win-win situation. Another difference between classic paleontology and mitigation paleontology is, for example, places like this. This is the upper Las Vegas wash. This is a picture from when work was being conducted there in 1956. And this is what it looked like in 1956. And I want you to look at that creosote bush and that creosote bush and that creosote bush. And this is what it looks like now. The vehicles changed, but the landscape hasn't. So when people were working there in the 1950s, they were finding fossils. When I and other paleontologists were working there in the past few years, same area, dozens of fossil localities because erosion keeps working and all of these sediments you're seeing are full of fossils. So the more you have occasional rain in the desert, and occasional wind in the desert, the more it exposes these fossils that are in the subsurface. So people were working there in the 50s. We went out and worked there in this century. You guys, your kids could go out there 50 years from now and continue finding fossils in the same area. In mitigation, you do not have that opportunity. The construction crews come in and when they are finished, it looks like this. And so you have only one chance to get at the fossils. And then you do. People generally don't like paleontologists knocking on their door and saying, can you move your swimming pool? It doesn't happen, <laughs> right? So once it's done, it's done, you have to get the fossil right because there's no going back. And then you have to get the assemblage right because it's going to be a subway or a housing tract or a transmission line or an oil pipeline or something. So there actually is a lot depending on the people that you have working for you. We're fortunate with Cogstone to have a really good team. There's a number of really good people working in Southern California paleontology right now. So, but really it's different. Uh, working with some people like uh, Kathleen Spring, working with her in Las Vegas. She goes out, she looks at the geology, we collect the fossils, we come back. We do the same thing in Joshua Tree National Park. And then the next year we go back out and check it again, and then the next year we check it again so you can have multi-year things. On so mitigation, this is it. What we just found from the subway, nobody's going to be digging down there again because there's a subway in the way. So this is the only chance we will have to look at these sediments. And so that makes mitigation paleontology relatively unique in paleontology. What you're looking at here is uh, Orange County, kind of the coastal part of Southern California, which is known for its beautiful vistas, but is also among paleontologists known for its fossils. But if you get out to Orange County and coastal Los Angeles County and Santa Barbara and so on, usually what you find is things like whales, some spectacular whale fossils found on construction sites, because again, otherwise you don't have that kind of digging on you. This is a whale, there's the blowhole, this is a baleen whale, and here's the front end. Uh, here's a beluga whale relative, that's where the big, I think it's called a melon would be. Um, and then we also find things like giant megalodon sharks, and usually you see them talked about on television, and they're always very exciting. How many of you knew that we had them here in Southern California? Oh, that's right, you're a paleontological. <laughs> what was I thinking? There's also things like this. This is a walrus, but it's, 
it actually got the long tongue from living all over. This is also from Orange County. We've got more terrestrial animals like this bear dog, which is a Eurasian immigrant that was just published, I want to say, last year, the year before. So that's a beautiful set. And then we've already talked about mammals. So all of this is stuff that's spread right under your feet. Now I do want to say, outside of the Lorraine carpets, if you want to look for Ice Age fossils, Orange County is not necessarily the place you want to do it. Uh, you want to move inland, and you want to move towards a, a little town, a little bird called Hemet, which in the 1990s was the site of what is still, I believe, the largest paleontological mitigation project that's ever been conducted in North America. And it's when the Metropolitan Water District, a completely different metro, uh, decided to take these farmlands, the Diamond Valley and the Dominagoni Valley, and build a dam there, and build a dam there, and pipe water in, and make it Southern California's largest freshwater reservoir, which is what it is today. It's Diamond Valley Lake. You can go there for the good fishing. Um, but during the construction of this reservoir, between 1993 and 2000, it was the largest earth-moving excavation being undertaken anywhere in North America, and for that entire period, we had paleontologists out there looking for fossils and finding them. So uh, we found over 100,000 fossils. This is actually a mastodon skeleton. There's a limb bone, there's a limb bone, um, there's the tusk over there, and just a monster uh, assemblage. It's the largest non-asphaltic ice age assemblage known from anywhere in the American Southwest and it produced things like this. This is a mastodon skull nicknamed Max um, because at the time he was the largest uh, mastodon known from west of the Mississippi. Now there is a bigger one known from Colorado from the snow mastodon site that is actually the largest mastodon west of the Mississippi. So Max has been supplanted but he still keeps his nickname. This is Kathleen Sprayer. She was the lead scientist on this project and she was the reason it happened because original interpretations were that, well, you're not going to find very much in that area because nothing had been found in that area because it was farmlands. Again, it's not a classic paleontological situation with deserts and erosion and, and khaki clothes. It's farmlands. But if you're digging down 100 feet, 120 feet, you're going to get past the farmlands and into Ice Age dirt. And that's what happened. And 100,000 fossils later, it's now the largest Ice Age assemblage outside of asphaltic assemblages known from anywhere in Southern California, excuse me, the American Southwest. Now, the animals we found at Diamond Valley Lake are pretty much the same animals that you're finding here. Mammoths, mastodons, ground sloths, horses, bison, saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, we found them all. And so some of you might be wondering, why did you waste your time when we have all of that stuff at the Lorraine Park that's the point of finding more of it somewhere else, especially since you've got bulldozers and scrapers digging up your stuff, whereas here we have meticulous excavators who use dental and toothbrushes and are extraordinarily careful and the bones are beautifully preserved, so what is the point? Part of the point is that Rancho La Brea, as most of you probably know, is a biased assembly. What is the most common animal, none of you La Brea people, but some of you others, what is the most common animal you find here at the Tarpets? Direwolf. Direwolf. What's number two? Saber tooth cat. Saber tooth cat. What's number three? No. Coyote. Hmm? Coyote. Starts with a C, sounds like coyote. 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 Coyotes are number three. That was a gimme, wasn't it? Yeah. So your top three animals are meat eaters. Your top three animals here are meat eaters, and you know why that is the case. It's because you would have one stupid animal, like a horse, get stuck, and then you'd have some saber-toothed cats come in and look at the dumb stuck horse and they'd say lunch and they'd come in and they'd eat and they would get stuck. And then your pack of dire wolves would come in and they'd see all these animals stuck and they would say lunch and they would come in and they'd get stuck and they'd die. And then you have the carnivorous birds flying overhead and they look down and they'd say lunch. No, they say dinner. <laughs> And they land, and they get stuck, and they die, so you have this giant, big, rotting mass of death. I want you to think about that next time you're looking through the tar pits. All of these animals that you see here died horribly. It was awful. None of them died of old age. All of them died 
in fear and panic and misery trapped in an asphalt deposit. It's awful. I'm sorry, but it really, really was. Anyway, my point being is that kept happening for tens of thousands of years. Literally, you end up with a very top-heavy carnivore-based assemblage, which means it's not necessarily reflecting what was actually going on here, the actual representation of animals that were here during the Ice Ages. Whereas in Hemet, we have lots of bison, lots of horses, lots of mastodons, a bunch of ground sloths, a bunch of mammoths, one or two saber-toothed cats, two or three dire wolves. It appears to be a relatively normally distributed assemblage. And so it gives you a better picture of the relative abundance of these animals in a living community through time. It also gives you a more inland perspective. You get away from the coastal influence, you get into the inland valleys of Southern California, and it paints a slightly different picture. So if I ask you about mammoths and mastodons here, do we have a lot of them? Not relative to anything else. We have more mammoths and mastodons from Duncan Valley Lake than you do here. In terms of numbers of individuals, we have more bison and horse than you have here. So you have more phones because we would have a tooth preserved or a foot bone preserved, whereas you have partial skeletons preserved. So fewer individuals, more bones here. More individuals, fewer bones inland. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. These fossils you can go see if you want to uh, go on a field trip. How many of you have been to the Western Science Center in Hammond? More of you need to raise your hands mm -hmm. next time I come out here, if you ever invite me back, because it really is a spectacular place. This is what it looks like on the inside. And I want to emphasize this because it's a beautiful museum where these fossils are on display. And this is a museum that was built specifically to house the fossils from this mitigation project. Mm -hmm. So because of this video, it's not just we found some fossils, it's an entire museum is now new in this community. And research is being done. Right now, I don't want to give the details away, but right now scientists are studying mastodon teeth, and it turns out that Hemet mastodons and La Brea mastodons and some other mastodons from the American Southwest have different things going on than mastodons, say, back east in Illinois or up north in Canada. It's like this weird pocket of different mastodons with different things going on, and I don't want to get more into it, but it's really cool, and you might be hearing about it relatively soon, so just leave that there. <laughs> but we started studying this, a guy named Alton Dooley started studying this, because the fossils were found on a mitigation site. We also have scientists from around the country and around the world who are coming in. This guy's actually sampling teeth from mastodons so that he can study the microware analysis figure out what they were eating. And they're scanning these bones, many of them, so that they can be made available uh, for education purpose and to purposes and to other scientists so that they can study them elsewhere without having to fly all the way to beautiful downtown Hemet, California. They're missing out on the food in Hemet, though, so I think that's a mistake. But nevertheless, if they want to save their travel dollars, they can study things that way. There's also this art. I mentioned Brian and Eng earlier. This is another one of his works. This is his restoration of Max the Mastodon. And I would like to emphasize that this is not conveying it because he painted it life size. So this, this mural is 12 feet tall. It is, it's fantastic and the level of detail is extraordinary. The Manzanitas you see were found in the fossil record. The uh, Ponderosa Pines were found in the fossil record. The, there's a little lizard running around quite see it there, but he's in there just to be blocked because of the scale. Mm -hmm. But this is magnificent, so you have a museum, you have a collection, you have research, you have art. How many of you uh, have kids who are going to be inspired by art like this to go on and study these things or do art themselves? And all of it because of a mitigation project that otherwise would never have happened because it was flat farmlands where nobody expected fossils. This is why mitigation can be so significant and so important. Mitigation has even had its effect here at the La Brea Tar Pits because, and some of you remember this, uh, there didn't used to be a Page Museum. Back in the day, there's Hancock Park, there's Wilshire Boulevard, there's Hancock Park, you notice the complete absence of a museum for the fossils. That ended in the 1970s where this gentleman, George C. Page, gave $5 million to build 
this museum. It means it was going to, they looked around Hancock Park, figured out where they wanted to put it. They dug a lot of test trenches and holes to figure out where they weren't going to hit any fossils. And they figured out it was going to be on the eastern side of Hancock Park. They start digging and they hit fossils. <laughs> this is from that excavation. This is a saber tooth cat skull. There is the saber. And that is the lower jaw. And for those of you who know your La Brea fossils, this almost never happens. Usually the fossils are disarticulated. They're in a big jumble. You can see that out on exhibit right now here in this museum. And yet, one of the first fossils they find is articulated. And so this led to a hint that maybe there was something different going on. And so before the museum was built, there was a mitigation project conducted where the deposit was put into jackets and they were preserved. This is known as the Page Museum Salvage Project. And granted, these people are not wearing their safety vests as you would expect, but this is 1975, and so it's a little before you think it was brand new and people are still figuring out how to do this sort of thing. But they actually found any number, they were made any number of uh, plaster jackets. It was a flat tabular deposit. This is looking down on it. And these jackets here have all been prepped out. These here are still <laughs> in storage awaiting preparation including what is probably a bison skeleton with carnivores on top of it right there. So in the 1980s, if any of you remember the 1980s, this is the work that was going on in the paleontology lab in the fishbowl. You can come in and see the Page Museum salvage jackets being excavated, and this is what they look like. And instead of the meter by meter or the three foot by three foot excavation that was going on um, in 91, they used 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter tiny little excavations. But you can bones all through there. This is a saber-toothed cat thorax. There's the vertebrae, and these are all the ribs. All semi-articulated. This is one individual. This is, at the time, I don't know about Project 23, but at the time, for the Page Museum salvage, this was unheard of. No other deposits had yielded anything like this. A few months later, you've gotten rid of all of these, and there is your backbone, and there's the ribs on the other side. Mm -hmm. And they got jacket after jacket after jacket after jacket of pieces that remain to be excavated. I'm not trying to say that maybe you should jump into that. I think La Brea has more than enough going on right now, and it is. <laughs> but at some point, when everything else is exhausted, there's still more work to be done, and it's a really cool and interesting assemblage. During the time that was being worked on in the lab, Pit 91 was still producing fossils, and so that went on through the 1980s and into the 1990s and into the early 2000s, and that was kind of the La Brea thrust, is Page Museum salvage in the lab, Pit 91 during the summers, it was all a lot of fun, and then in 2006, your next door neighbors, the LA County, oh, sorry, the LA County Museum of Art decided they needed a parking structure. And I'm not disagreeing with them, but they said we needed to be a subterranean parking structure. What are the odds that they're going to start finding fossils? At this point, what do you think the odds are that they're going to start finding fossils? Yeah, the same sort of thing. So they start digging, and sure enough, the fossils start coming up. This is a dire wolf skull. That's the zygomatic. There's the eye hole. There's the nose hole. His teeth probably. So right off the bat, they start finding fossils there, too. And as it turns out, they find a lot of fossils over there, because it's a big parking lot area. They found over 16 new tar pit deposits, as well as other little bits and pieces here and there. So 16 brand new tar pits. How long, okay, trivia question for you guys. How long have paleontologists been excavating pit 91? When did it open? 1969. What year is it now? 2009. It's been going for almost half a century and they aren't finished yet. One pit. So how long do you think it's going to take you to build, to, ex to, build, to excavate 16 additional tar pits? The answer is you're never, ever, ever going to see your parking structure. Ever. <laughs> or you build tree boxes around each of the tar pits and you haul them out and you store them over here. And that's what they ended up doing. So yes, there's a nice parking structure over at the art museum. You can park there comfortably for a lot of money. And, I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? And these boxes remain in the Pit 91 compound and Karen is shaking her head. Why are you shaking your head? 
They look kind of scouty, don't they? This is how they ended up, but this is what they look like today. It's actually become part of the exhibit here. This is part of what you can see as a business in this area. And this is Project 23, for the 23 boxes that were collected as part of that excavation. And this is what's going on right now. And I apologize, this is an older picture. I need to get more current. Some of these people don't work here anymore. But nevertheless, um, this is what goes on in each of these boxes is paleontologists on a daily basis excavating fossils the same way they always have at La Brea, but what they are producing and what is being investigated is the result of the mitigation project. Is here not because of the classic work that's been done at La Brea, but because of a mitigation project because of California laws. And that was going on outside. That's also going on inside the lab, or at least it was. This is Ted, the mammoth. And he's the biggest mammoth so far. In fact, he's the most complete mammoth that I know of uh, from La Brea. Also found as a result of a mitigation project. So he's no longer in the lab. I think he's still oozing asphalt somewhere, but nevertheless, <laughs> this lets you know. So there was a huge amount of work that was being done as a result of paleontological mitigation, even at a classic site like the Rancho La Brea Targets. So you have the old school classic paleontology informing things here, and you have newer paleontology things informing things here from the surrounding area. So the collections here continue to grow. When they were first excavating back in 1913 to 1915, there were three quarters of a million fossils found. Now it's over four million fossils are estimated to have come from Rachel Abraham. And that number is continuing to grow on a daily basis. And all of those wonderful fossils are from the tar pits, which means they are a biased assemblage. You're still finding things that are carnivore heavy. It's still focused on saber-toothed cats and dire wolves and even coyotes. So while it's an amazingly rich source of information, there are some kinds of questions, like about ancient ecosystems, about the relative abundance of individuals that you can't necessarily confidently get at when you're studying fossils here. And that, finally, brings us back to the fossils from the subway, which is, in many cases, we have yet to find an asphalt deposit. I don't think we're going to at this late date. But what about all the animals who lived here that were smart enough not to get stuck in a tar pit? What about them? So what are we finding? Well, there's one right off the bat. This is found two years ago, 2016. That is a femur of a mammoth. The jacketed, uh, that's Janice. Um, she's the one who found it. And again, uh, she's 40 feet below the ground, but otherwise it's classic paleontological techniques. You dig around it, you put some uh, fossil wrapping paper on it, you cover it in plaster, you flip it over, and you take it back to your museum. This is what it looks like now. That's what we're missing part of it, because again, it's excavated by construction equipment. But this mammoth did not get stuck in a tar pit. It lived and died, probably died very gently, happily. You know, none of the horror that's associated with the fossils that you see here. Um, as I will mention uh, as we go on, mammoths and mastodons actually are fairly common in the assemblage that we are finding here. Part of it is because on a construction site, great big bones like this tend to jump out at you. A part of this also because these animals are probably fairly abundant in the region. And you don't see that at La Brea because the animals were big enough to pull themselves out of a tar pit when they got stuck. Hmm. With the exception of Zed, I think almost all of the mammoths here, if not all of the mammoths and maximums here, were from pit number nine, which is interpreted to have been a deeper pit, which would have made it more difficult for the animals to pull out. <laughs> Zed was an anomaly in so many wonderful ways. But uh, elsewhere, you probably had a lot of mammoths and a lot of mammoths living in this area. This is another elephant-like animal. There's the top of the skull is gone, but there you've got a little tusk. And there you've got a little tusk. Now, sometimes paleontologists will nickname their fossils, like Max was nicknamed, like Zed was nicknamed. This one was nicknamed Hayden. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not the one who nicknamed him or her. Hayden does work as a male or female name. We don't know. Um, we didn't know if it was a mammoth or a mastodon, but we took it back to the lab, we cleaned it up, and those are mammoth teeth. Do you guys know how to tell mammoths and mastodons apart? You've been very good, but yeah. The mammoths have um, teeth for grazing that are High more like elk, like African elephants, while the mastodon has <coughs> pointed teeth for absolutely, absolutely correct. 
We, when I was a little paleontologist, we'd say that mammoth teeth were more washboard-like, but I don't think that anybody knows what a washboard <laughs> is anymore, so I don't know that that works. But this is a mammoth tooth, and as the gentleman was saying, you can see it's relatively flat, made for grazing. This is a mastodon tooth. It's got more uh, pronounced bulbous cusps. Does anybody know, obscure, what does mastodon mean? It means breast tooth. It means breast tooth because to the paleontologist who named it, this looks like little rows of breasts. Don't ask me, I wasn't there. It was a French guy. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, here's what Hayden's teeth look like. And you can see those are clearly mammoth teeth. And what you can also see is that Hayden was not an adult. This is, or was, the next tooth in sequence starting to erupt and had the animal lived, it would have pushed this tooth out on either side. But Hayden didn't live. Probably the animal was six or seven years old when it died. Again, didn't die in a tar pit, but still that kind of young to die. Uh, Hayden actually made a trip back here for a little while. This is us returning Hayden to his or her old stomping grounds and taking him down into the lab where for several weeks you could have come to the fishbowl laboratory and seen Hayden being prepared here. Uh, which is such a popular thing that it even made a YouTube video fe uh, featuring your curator here, Emily Lindsay, who was interviewed about fossils from the Metro subway. So how cool is that? I don't want to mislead you into thinking that we're just finding mammoths and mastodons. We're also finding fossils like this. Are you impressed by this? I was, because it cleaned up to look like this. This is a bison jaw. And it's a beautiful bison jaw. And again, you guys are used to bison jaws. Oh, yes, we have a little rat. And I know you do. But this is not a tar pit. This is naturally preserved. And it's gorgeous. It's just missing the back end. And I got very excited about this. And I should have just held my fire. Because within a couple of weeks, we found this. This is what it looks like in the field. And some of you excavators are going, hey, that's the nose, that's the eye, and that's the heart. This is a bison skull. And other than a little bit of damage right there, which can be easily repaired, it looks to be complete. Yes, the other horn core is not there, but we found it nearby. So we have both horn cores. And when we got this back to the lab and we cleaned this up, it looks like that. And it's not a tar pit. That is a naturally occurring fossil. Isn't that gorgeous? Mm -hmm. I will say that outside of the tar pits, and again, I worked on Diamond Valley Lake. I've worked in a lots of places, and the tar pits has some beautiful bison skulls. Outside of that, this is the most complete and most beautifully preserved bison skull I know of from anywhere in Southern California. It's just spectacular. And so, and it's coming back to the Natural History Museum, so you might drop hints that maybe it would make a nice exhibit. Just saying, stop, you know. <laughs> it has a little horn cord, but it also has fully adult teeth. So we know it is a fully adult animal, and yet it's got a little tiny horn cord. And what does that mean? No. As we've already talked about, that means it was not bison latifrons, it was the smaller bison and teeth. What did it just do? Oh, I know this. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Wrong button. It means that we again know that we're falling in this time frame. Once again, by identifying the species, we can put an approximate relative age on the fossil we're finding. We know it's in the last part of the last ice. That fossil is still being prepared uh, by Bethany, one of our best monitors, and also a gift is prepared. So we've got some real who started here, by the way, working down in Project 23 and doing stuff down there. So for those of you who might want to be paleontologists later in life, Start thinking about volunteering here. That's how I got my start. That's how any number of other people here got their start. You do have to be 16 years old or older, or you have to know somebody. So just keep that in mind. But did I say that out loud? They're going to bounce my check. No. Um, anyway, so that is still going on. In addition, we've got things like horses. This is a horse tooth. And for some of you, I point out that we know it's Equus because it's got that feature right there. Sorry, that was me being obscure. But um, we haven't found a lot of horse, which is weird because horses are the second most common plant-eating animal that you find here at the Tar Pits. And if you go down to Hemet, to Diamond Valley Lake, horses are the second most common plant-eating animal that you find in that assemblage. And yet, so far, horse remains have been very thin on the ground or under the ground in terms of what we're finding on the subway. We're also finding things like this beautiful camel. Anybody? Yeah, it's a camel radius ulna. These bones right here. This is what it looks like in the field. 
And you can see that it was found by a piece of construction equipment catching it right there. So this is what it looks like in the lab. This is a young lady named Cassidy Sharp, another one of our monitors slash preparators who also has worked here at the tar pits. Am I getting that point home? This is a good place to start your career as a paleontologist. And what she's doing is repairing the broken parts of this camel bone. Camels are extremely rare. I think we've got three camel fossils from all of the assemblies that we've collected. Cassidy also found this, which is very cool. This is Notrotherios, the Shasta ground sloth. And this is the, the middle digit from the hand. I would show you on my hand, but then I might make you the bad gesture. So <laughs> just take my word for it. It's from the middle of the hand. Um, and we find two different kinds of sloths here. We find Notrotherios and we find Paramylodox, which are the same ones that you find commonly here. So that's consistent, but we don't find a lot of them. Generally speaking, the assemblage that we're finding is dominated by proboscideans, mammoths and mastodons, and by bison, which the bison we knew about from La Brea, the proboscideans, not so much. Now, I will emphasize that our sample size is very small. We don't have a lot of fossils. We certainly don't have fossils uh, to the number that La Brea does or even Diamond Valley Lake. So it's a very small assemblage, but we are also supplementing it. Number one, we're still collecting, so bring me back next year or two years or five years from now and I'll give you an update. Number two, we're supplementing it with other localities from the Natural History Museum that were collected in this part of the LA Basin over the past century or so. And they're all painting the same basic pictures. That lots of elephants, lots of bison, relatively fewer than the other animals. In terms of carnivorous, because we're not finding things that are asphalt derived, we aren't finding. We have not found any saber tooth cats. We have not found any dire wolves. We have found a carnivore that you don't have here at the target. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Human? ah, that's Humans are omnivores. Oh. Yeah. Oh. 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 If you guys find an otter in the tar pits, that's news, man. Just swimming along up the river, what the heck? And then he dies horribly, awfully, like all these other animals. I really want you to remember that. It was horrible. Anyway, uh, I mean, we found otters. We actually have two different bones. This is the upper arm bone, the humerus, and this is the lower forelimb bone. This is from an older rock unit called the San Pedro Formation, which is a nearshore marine unit, so it makes sense. This is from older alluvium. This is from the Pleistocene stuff that's producing mammoths and mastodons and bison and so forth. So you wouldn't have expected to see going carnivore, but based on the geology and based on the anatomy of that bone, that's what we've got. So how cool is that? I think it's pretty cool. And I can do what La Brea cannot do is wish you a belated happy otter day. There's no otters here. Have I made that point? Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, also of interest, this is a, an animal known as Stockosteris. It is a pronghorn, and it's known from Mexico, and it's known from New Mexico, and it's known from Arizona, and it's known from the Antiparado here in California, but always from early to middle Ice Age sites. It doesn't appear to have made it into the late part of the Ice Age. And it's characterized by having two horn cores, where if you look at modern pronghorn, they've got one horn core, and then that is a horny outgrowth, not a bony outgrowth. And so you can tell them at a glance, Antilocapra, the genus of modern pronghorn, has one horn core, Stockosteros had two. And so here we are with this fossil, which has two horn core times. This appears to be Stockosteros, and it's the first record for this region. We didn't know it was anywhere in the LA basin at any point in time. And so it comes from that same San Pedro formation. It's very worn down and abraded, so it appears to be a terrestrial animal whose fossil was remains then washed out into that shallow marine environment near shore. So it appears to have been transported. So a very cool find. We're still confirming the identification, but we're quite excited to have found this. And we're still comparing it with fossils at the Natural History Museum and here, because that's part of what you need to do, is make sure that your, identi uh, your identifications are as correct as you can make them. You don't want to make false interpretations. We're fortunate to be able to do that because many of the Cogstone team are also associates with the La Brea Tar Pits Museum and with the Natural History Museum, so we can actually take advantage of that to confirm that the science we are presenting, everything I'm talking about to you guys today, is as accurate as we can possibly make it. 
we're also actively working with the staff here. We're consulting with them. That's why Hayden came back and was worked on in the fishbowl. This is Sherry Gus. She is the president of Cogstone. She's the person who actually created the company that I work for. She's actually working here in the collections today. And here she is uh, with John Harris, former curator here, and Emily Lindsay, your current curator here, talking about the fossils that we are finding. And so you do have uh, that collaboration going on with personnel here. We're also collaborating with the Natural History Museum down in Exposition Park. This is Alan Zaninak, who is their lead paleontological preparator. And here he is in Riverside talking with uh, Kim Scott with about Hayden and how best to finish preparing Hayden so that he can then be prepared according to Natural History Museum standards so that when this collection goes to the Natural History Museum, it's already set and ready to go. And, and 